Hello, everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for July 10th, 2023. This is the time of week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. My name is Tim, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python that's designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. The development for CircuitPython is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support uh, Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from them over on adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server, which you can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel, as well as the CircuitPython voice channel. The meeting typically occurs on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern or 11 a.m. Pacific, uh, except when that coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there is a link to a calendar that you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. Uh, we also send out notifications about the upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive those notifications, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role, the same role that allows you to speak uh, during the meeting. There is a shared notes document that accompanies the meeting and recording. The final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video so that you can use the doc to skip around and uh, view the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes. Uh, it just depends on the number of folks that we have for the round robin sections. After each meeting, we will post a link to the next meeting's notes document in the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. You can check the pinned messages there in the CircuitPython dev channel uh, throughout the week to always find the latest notes document, um, or I should say the most upcoming notes document. Uh, if you wish to participate but you cannot attend, that's totally fine. You can leave hug reports and status updates in the document, and we'll read those out during the meeting. Uh, the meeting is uh, structured to be held in five parts. The first part is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of the Python on microcontrollers uh, newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. That one is a quantitative overview of the entire project, the chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from our status updates. The third part, and the first of our two round robins, is uh, the Hug Reports section. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, take some time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. Uh, the fourth part and the uh, second of our two round robins is status updates. Status updates is an opportunity to report on what you've been up to. Take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing in the last week or uh, two weeks uh, as it is this time uh, since the previous meeting or what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. Uh, the fifth and final section is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussion. Those discussions can come out of status updates or be identified ahead of time. Um, it, and those will be listed down in the bottom of the notes document like we talked about before. Uh, so that covers how the meeting will go. So with that, I will get the timestamp started and jump into community news for the week. Uh, let's get, yeah, there we go. Uh, so news in the news uh, letter this week, uh, which is I think a day early this week. So that one's already out. Check your uh, email inbox for that. Um, the uh, items that caught my attention this week were the release of CircuitPython 8.2.0. Uh, CircuitPython 8.2.0 is the latest minor release version of CircuitPython, uh, and it's been marked as a new stable release. There is a posting here on the Adafruit blog, as well as a link to the release notes on GitHub. A uh, couple notable changes that have been brought in since 8.1.0 are continued enhancement of the SynthIO module, as well as alarm.sleep memory for the RP2040 based devices. Uh, the next item uh, from the newsletter this week was uh, Thani has released a new version 4.1.0. Uh, the Thani Python IDE has released version 4.1.0. It includes an ESP flashing dialog that allows you to select from a list of known MicroPython or CircuitPython boards and downloads uh, them for you. It comes with Python 3.10 as well as additional updates. Uh, there are links here in the notes doc that take you to a uh, Twitter uh, message about the release as well as, again, the uh, link over to the actual release notes on GitHub itself. Uh, for the Thani project. Um, the next item here is um, from the United Kingdom. Uh, United Kingdom primary schools to get free BBC microbits. So the BBC has announced their new campaign. Uh, 
uh, which I believe they call BBC Microbit the next gen. Uh, and this campaign will empower primary school children ages 8 to 11 to gain digital skills. Uh, each primary school in the UK can register to claim 30 Microbit devices. The campaign is sponsored by the Microbit Educational Foundation, as well as Nominet, uh, who made the donation possible. Uh, teachers will be able to access training on the Microbit in person and online, and there is a link here, uh, I believe, to register for those free Microbits. So if you are hearing or reading this from the UK and you are a teacher, uh, head to the link in there and get registered to get yourself some free uh, microbits for the classroom. Um, next up, we have uh, IoT with Raspberry Pi Pico in Kenya. The Raspberry Pi Foundation provided free workshops in Kenya last month for the hardware community around Nairobi. In partnership with Gearbox and uh, Safaricom, they started with the Raspberry Pi Pico W and MicroPython. The participants started by learning the basics of MicroPython and blinking an LED. From there, they moved on to more advanced topics, including how to work with motion and proximity sensors, as well as environmental sensors. Lastly, they connected the Raspberry Pi Pico W to the internet and used Adafruit IO, uh, which is Adafruit's cloud platform for IoT, in order to graph their data, set up alerts, and create dashboards. Uh, there are uh, links here in the notes that take you to a raspberrypi.com news article discussing that topic. And the uh, last item that we have from the newsletter this week um, is about EuroPython 2023. This one was timely, so I decided to grab that in there for anybody that might be uh, interested. So this is uh, an upcoming uh, meetup in the Czech Republic, um, as well as with a remote component as well. And this is about a week from today. So today is the 10th of July. This starts on the 17th of July, one week from today. So if you are interested in EuroPython, uh, definitely check out the link here in the notes letter in order to find out about it and get involved if you are interested. Uh, so let's get a timestamp on this one. So these, uh, all these items came from CircuitPython newsletter. CircuitPython weekly newsletter is a CircuitPython community run newsletter that's emailed weekly. Uh, that's going to be emailed out on Mondays for the next couple of weeks. Um, the complete archives are available on adafruitdaily.com. And it highlights the latest in uh, Python on hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Py uh, MicroPython, and uh, standard Python developments. Uh, to contribute your own news or projects, you can edit next week's draft on GitHub, uh, submit a pull request with changes. Uh, you can also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter uh, or email to cpnews at adafruit.com. And with that, we will move over to the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Uh, it is uh, worth noting up at the top here this week, since we did not have a meeting last week, and the way that these uh, stats are aggregated is on kind of a rolling daily basis. That means that our stats for this week do uh, only cover the last seven days, which means that the seven days prior to that, uh, we did not actually catch in any meeting. So thank you to all the folks who contributed during that. Uh, period of time as well. Uh, we definitely fully appreciate all of them too, uh, but the system that does pull the stats is on a rolling um, schedule essentially. So we've got the last seven days here. So uh, in the last seven days, uh, overall, we have had 23 pull requests merged across the entire project. Uh, of those 23 pull requests, uh, they came from 16 authors. Um, I have a uh, highlighted a couple authors' names who were less familiar to me. So these might be folks that are either newer contributors or less frequent contributors, uh, or it could be the case that it's just a name that I don't happen to be familiar with, and maybe they have uh, contributed uh, more. But those folks this week, thanks to them uh, for getting involved. Those names are uh, Kai Zellin, uh, Joshua Beck 0908, uh, Impult, Creative Control, and KB Sriram. Uh, so thanks to those folks uh, who, again, were authors this week across various different uh, repositories related to the project. Um, for those authors, we had 10 reviewers looking over their work. Um, those do look like a pretty usual list of names there. So thanks, of course, to everyone uh, who uh, is reviewing those PRs for us. Of course, the more reviewers we have, the more authors we can support. So thank you to everyone who takes time to look over PRs and offer up comments, suggestions, um, thoughts, anything like that. Uh, 
Um, there were 13 closed issues by 9 people and 14 opened issues by 12 people. Um, in the last 7 days, uh, there were... Oops, uh, let's see here. Oh, I see, maybe this is the previous 7 days, I think. Yeah, yeah, this is the previous... Okay, so that works, actually. That's really nice. Yeah, I didn't think about grabbing the previous ones. Thank you to whoever grabbed this uh, early hug report. Uh, so for the previous seven days, so everything we talked about just a moment ago was uh, the current um, previous seven days. For the seven days before that, which is what we would have covered in last week's meeting, um, overall for those, we had 11 pull requests merged uh, from 12 authors. Uh, and the highlighted names there for newer or less frequent contributors are Jimmo and N0XA. So thank you to those folks. Uh, during that seven-day period, we had eight reviewers. Uh, again, looks like mostly the usual suspects, so thanks to those folks again as well. Uh, and during that prior seven-day period, we had uh, eight closed issues by five people with 18 issues opened by 15 people. Uh, and with that, I will pass it over to Scott if you're available to tell us about the core. Sure. So these numbers are, are just... Uh the previous week so we're ignoring uh, it does not include the two weeks ago um so this is five pull request merge from five different authors uh kai zelen is a new name to me so thank you to them um, we have four reviewers so thank you to all of our reviewers we have 27 open pull requests so we're just above kind of that 25 threshold which means it's on a single page uh, so as always please take a look at pull requests and see what we can't get merged in uh, we had four closed issues by two people and nine opened by nine people, so we're net up five uh, for a total of 671 open issues. Um, Milestone-wise, uh, this is how we track prioritization for folks funded by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython, meaning if you're not funded by us, uh, feel free to, to pick up whatever is interesting to you. Um, so we have 42 open issues for 9.0. Um, we don't have a milestone currently for 8.2x but we may in case we need to follow up with anything. Um, and we have 590 open issues. Five issues are not assigned to milestone, so we'll need to do a round of triaging for those as well. And that's the stats for the core. All right, thank you, Scott. Uh, next up, I will send it over to Katni if you're available to tell us about the libraries. I sure am. All right, so this is again over the last week. Um, we had uh, this, this section applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries and the CircuitPython community libraries. Across all of those repositories, we had 15 pull requests merged by 10 different authors and 10 reviewers, which is excellent. Um, the oldest, actually, no, geez, a lot of old ones. Um, for over 400 days, uh, days open, there were two of them. Um, there were, there was one at 73 days and two over 20 days, uh, which is excellent. Um, I asked, uh, our host today to start looking at some of the older PRs. And so some of those have been, uh, taken care of or merged or closed and that sort of thing. Um, so I, it's nice to see the progress there, um, at the top of the list. And that leaves us with 61 open pull requests. We had nine issues closed by eight people and five opened by five people, leaving us with 633 open issues. 46 of those are labeled good first issue. If you're interested in contributing to the libraries or contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, the libraries are a great place to start. Check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, including the actual list of open pull requests and the list of open issues. Um, if you're interested in reviewing, check out the pull requests. If you are interested in contributing uh, Python code or documentation, check out the open issues. If you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start. We also have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, and we're always on Discord to help you out. We want to make sure that you can contribute in a way that works for you. Uh, we have library uh, PyPI download stats here. Uh, over 310 libraries, there were 151,621 downloads. And the top 10 PyPI downloaded libraries are available in the notes doc. I noticed the numbers are back up to where they are usually. The last few weeks, they've been surprisingly low. Um, so I guess people took a break from PyPI stuff. Uh, in terms of library updates in the last seven days, we have one new library from Furbrain, 
uh, called CircuitPython underscore CaveBLE, and a few updated libraries, which I will not read off. And uh, that's other than the the note about the fact that older um, older PRs are now being looked into. If you have an open PR on a library that is um, aging, uh, expect to see um, some action on it uh, either already or soon. And um, please uh, respond to it, or if you don't, we're going to close it, but we can always reopen it if you're interested in picking it up again in the future. Um, just be aware of that. And that's where we are with the libraries. All right, thank you very much, Katni. Uh, next up uh, is uh, the Blinka section. I will send it over to Maker Melissa if you're available for that. Sure, yeah. Uh, so Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this uh, last couple, well, these stats kind of apply more to the last week than the last two weeks. But uh, there were three pull requests merged uh, by two authors and one reviewer. There are currently three open pull requests. Uh, there were zero closed issues. Um, and zero open ones. There are currently 98 open issues, and there were uh, 12,278 PyPI downloads in the last week, and 7,022 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we are at 119 boards. And that's it. Excellent. Thanks, Melissa. So that wraps up the state of CircuitPython, the libraries in Blinka. So our next section will be the first of our two round robins. It will be the Hug Reports section. Uh, as a reminder, Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start and then we'll go down the list alphabetically and give everyone a chance to participate. If you're text only or missing the meeting, then I'll read the notes uh, when we get to you in the list. Uh, so I will get us going. This week uh, I have Hug Reports. Thank you to uh, Blitz City DIY as well as DJ Devin, who uh, both started kicking off the process of updating library examples to use uh, the newer settings.toml over the older secrets.py recently. So thanks to those folks. It's not um, necessarily glamorous uh, work, so to speak, but I think is um, very important and very appreciated. Um, thanks to uh, Jose David for trying out uh, an old display button PR and offering some great feedback on that recently. Um, thank you to uh, JP, uh, John Park from the Adafruit live streams, who recently created a repo and started uh, collecting and sharing the code that's shown during the CircuitPython Parsec videos, which I think is uh, really great. So thanks to JP for that. And uh, I also have a group hug this week for everybody. Uh, so with that, I will send it over to Dan next. Okay, thanks. Uh, this week I'd like to thank Katni and Paul Cutler who were taking over the weekly Python and microcontroller newsletters while Anne is away on vacation. And the first one went off great. You notice it might be a day early, some or all the time. Um, uh, but they'll continue to do the smooth job that Anne started with. Thanks very much. Ready? Yep. Thank you, Dan. Uh, next up is Jeff. Hi. So I wanted to give a thank you to Neradoc for a CircuitPython bundle called CircuitPython Keyboard Layouts. It's a bundle full of mostly international keyboard layouts that work with CircuitPython. And when we get to my status updates, I'll tell you a little bit more about why. I wanted to thank uh, Tack and Scott for so much groundwork on USB host. Like I told Scott when I was talking directly to him the other day, uh, you know, I built it and put it on my device, and it just worked the first time, the first thing I wanted to try. And that's really exciting. Uh, so thank you to both of you. To Dan, thank you for being the release manager and for releasing 8.2.0. Uh, the Adafruit iOS mobile developer by the name of Antonio, I owe a big hug report for uh, reverse engineering the Teddy Ruxpin audio format. And now we've got a uh, working converter that you can run on any old host computer with Python to create fresh audio files. It's really exciting. All right, back to CircuitPython world. A hug to Jimmo from the MicroPython project for a documentation fix. That's Jimmo's first PR into CircuitPython, but of course we use a ton of uh, his work that we inherit through CircuitPython. Uh, a hug for Lady Ada for sending a prototype Metro RP2040 my way. I need to check out some specific functionality on that prototype board 
before it goes into production. And lastly, a group hug. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, next up is DJ Devin 3, who's text only, so I will read. Uh, DJ Devin has uh, hug reports for Dan H, as well as Nerdoc, for helping with a display issue on the uh, yes, S2 reverse TFT device. Uh, another hug report for Dan H for the idea to create portable RFM95 distance tester months ago. Uh, DJ Devin just got around to making one and it worked out very well. Uh, hug report for Tyeth and Dan H for advice on automating heart rate, oxygen, and blood pressure monitoring. Uh, I understand hacking medical devices isn't the best idea in the world, but I was quite desperate and appreciated your patience and understanding. Uh, hug report for Tyeth for helping me understand some of the inner workings of the Adafruit Hashlib library. Uh, hug, report, hug report for Dan H and Kevin T for helping with a random number generator. Uh, went through a couple of different iterations before settling on os.urandom uh, and passing in random.randint uh, with a range of 43 to 128, which uh, it turns out satisfies Fitbit's OAuth salt requirement, uh, I assume for interacting with their API. Uh, and then uh, lastly, a hug report thanks to Tyeth and uh, her, uh, excuse me, her brain uh, for joining the helpers, helpers role over on Discord. Uh, and next up, I will pass it over to Katni. Thanks. So first up, a huge hug for Paul uh, for so much help on this week's Python uh, on hardware newsletter, the one that shipped today. Um, the original plan was that uh, I would do the first one, um, Paul would guest edit the second one, and then I would be doing the third one. It turns out the real plan is that we're both basically working together on the entire thing. Um, it was such a relief last week to have all that help, and I just really appreciate it. Uh, to Dan for ensuring the newsletter post went up as expected, um, there's a th an extra thing that has to happen before it emails, and you can fix it if it doesn't quite work right but only before the email check. So um, Dan made sure that that was good to go. Uh, to Toddbot, for an amazing hour and a half long chat about synth basics, I have a much greater understanding of a lot of um, basic synth features now uh, than I did, and that's really exciting. Um, to Airbrain for uh, joining the community helpers on Discord. To the Discord helpers overall and uh, the Discord moderators for a thoughtful discussion about a specific issue and for handling a few uh, other issues incredibly well. Um, thanks to the folks who suggested Hairbrain for the community helpers role. Um, they were not on my radar, but uh, uh, that was, it's always good to, to have um, suggestions there. Um, to Dan for helping with a code example I was attempting to adapt from Arduino and failing. Turns out uh, CircuitPython can't really do it the way Arduino does, um, so I would have been going in circles for a very long time. To uh, Tim, you for going through all the stale PRs across the libraries and seeing what the next step should be. Also to you for working through removing secrets.py on the ESP32 SPI library uh, for, and replacing it with settings.toml. Um, hug to everyone I'm certain I missed since it's been two weeks since the last meeting, and a group hug. All right, thank you, Katni. Uh, next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, let's see here. I lost my place. Um, oh, yeah, I was just uh, doing a group hug to everyone on this. All right, yeah, thank you, Melissa. Uh, next up is Paul. Thanks, Tim. I've got a hug for Katni for showing me the ins and outs of putting the weekly Python on hardware newsletter together, as well as some excellent editing, catching some mistakes that I made. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next up is Scott. Hello. I've got two. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce their name, but Seki Gonganik, uh, who did the PIO USB stuff. Uh, did a quick re PR review and merge for me last week or over the weekend, so thank you to them. And then also a hug to Jeff uh, for the USB keyboard support boost uh, with their report to serial code from their CPM project. Uh, that made it much quicker for me to get a demo going, so thanks, Jeff, for that. All right, thank you, Scott. 
Uh, and that is it for Hug Reports. So next up, we will change over to the status updates section. Uh, as a reminder, status updates is our time to tell folks what we've been up to individually. I'll start and then we'll go through the list alphabetically. When I call on you, you can take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be up to until the next meeting. Uh, it's also an opportunity for folks to provide tips and trips, tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion does become too long for status updates, we can always bump it down to in the weeds. Uh, so I will take a timestamp and get us started. Um, I have been working on a couple things. One of them was wrapping up the ESP32 SPY socket compatibility changes and getting those merged. Uh, all the PRs that are related to that stuff after another round of testing over this past weekend. Um, I also started working on a way to show outline text with configurable stroke, color, and size. Uh, and to that end, I completed a hacky, hard-coded proof of concept that uh, does work and uses simple bitmap uh, manipulation just with the slice, uh, like square bracket accessing and setting pixels. Uh, from there, I added functionality inside a bitmap blit uh, in the core in order to speed up the bitmap dilation process uh, by doing some of the stamping in the core. So it was iterating through lots and lots of pixels and doing that in the core is much faster. Um, so that provided a pretty good speed boost, but it did lead to the next issue, which was that adding that functionality pushed a couple of boards, uh, a couple of builds over the size limit. Uh, so from there, I refactored that bitmap blit function over into bitmap tools, which is already uh, disabled on the devices that don't have as much room. Um, so now that is over there, everything is back under the limit, and the new functionality uh, still works and does exactly the same thing. You just uh, call it from a different module. Uh, with all of that done, I actually did also sit down on, uh, I think it was Friday, and worked on the outlined label class, so an actual kind of higher level class that makes this functionality much easier to reuse. It's pretty much uh, fairly close to a drop-in replacement for the existing label. You just uh, set up a couple extra arguments for your stroke size and color, uh, and then beyond that, you can treat it the same way. You get some nice uh, outlined text. Um, and kind of the last thing I have in mind for that is I'd like to ultimately also create a dilation helper function inside bitmap tools. Um, the newer version with that's using blit from the core is much faster than the original was, but I think uh, moving the actual dilation into the core would be another pretty big speed up because we are still iterating through pretty much all the pixels inside the bitmap. So uh, that's kind of my final plan on that front. A um, couple other things I was doing, uh, I have been... Let's see, I started this morning uh, changing over the ESP32 SPY library, both the internal components as well as the examples to start using settings TOML instead of secrets. Um, I am, as Katni mentioned, following up on older library PRs. Uh, so I'll be going through posting follow-up comments on those to see uh, what the status is and if they remain active for a little while after that comment, then I will go back through and close them, uh, but they can always certainly be reopened in the future if they do become active. So uh, like Katley, Katley mentioned as well, if you have a, a PR open and, and you think it's waiting on us or needs a, somebody to take a look at it, feel free to ping me uh, there. Otherwise, I will make it to there in time uh, and get all of that moving. Um, and the last thing, uh, over the weekend, I started writing a clone for the old Atari game called Breakout. Uh, mine runs on a Pi Portal and uses a Stemma QT gamepad as the controller, and it uses Vector IO for graphics. I uh, have not published it anywhere yet, but I'll probably put it up on uh, GitHub at some point for other folks to play with if they would like. And that is it for me, so I will send it over to Dan next. Okay, thanks. So uh, after a number, many, many steps, we got to... Uh, CircuitPython 8.2.0 final last Wednesday, that's released. Um, importantly, if you have an NRF board, the bootloader on your board is probably may not be able to load uh, CircuitPython 8.2.0 because it's larger than the maximum size that the old bootloaders could load, and you need to update the bootloader. It's not as simple as just loading a UF2 updater file, so check the guide pages for your board about that. And as a consequence of that, I, I made sure that all the guide pages, the guide page for how to do that update was mirrored across all uh, the, Ad the Adafruit boards. 
So check that out, and I also updated it in uh, circuitpython.org on the download pages. And then I did some other uh, learn guide work. There's a more extensive discussion of what Blinka is and how it works and how it's not CircuitPython, but is a compatibility library. And that's the second page in a bunch of Blinka, Blinka guides now. And the uh, overview pages is, is a little redundant with that, so we'll clean up the overview pages. But check that out if you want a better explanation or you want to give somebody a pointer to a better explanation of Blinka or a more complete explanation. Um, I followed up. I like tested a bunch of bug reports to see if they were real. Some of them were, some of them weren't. Uh, that is a constant thing every week. And though I didn't do much on the MicroPython merge last week, I did work on it a little, and I'm going to work on it more this week. Okay, that's it. All righty, thank you, Dan. Uh, next up is DJ Devin 3 who's text only, so I'll read. Uh, DJ Devin says, finished a, a portable RFM95 range finder using a battery-powered ESP32-S2 reverse TFT and an RFM95 featherwing. Uh, I went for a drive and figured out the real-world max distance for my area to my LoRa mailbox uh, boombox. Uh, thanks to Dan H. for the idea to make it. Uh, next item is got a Fitbit. Uh, Fitbit to help track some of my elderly mother's vitals. I chose Fitbit because they have a 24-7 heart rate monitor feature and web API. I've successfully adapted it for use with the Adafruit requests library using get and post requests as well as uh, the refresh tokenizer uh, is working. It's just a matter of cleaning up the OAuth code to release it as a simple example. Uh, Fitbit's OAuth token scheme is the most stringent that I've come across thus far. It requires a randomized 23 to 128-bit salt, uh, which is hashed with uh, SHA-256 and then Base64 URL encoded. Uh, unlike most other APIs, the Fitbit API token expires every eight hours. If your application doesn't make a request at least once every eight hours to create an automated refresh token, you must generate an entirely new set of tokens and start over. Uh, it has not been fun to work with. Uh, on a personal note, my mother, who's been bedridden in the hospital ICU for weeks, finally got over pneumonia, fever, and sepsis. Uh, she's now at a rehab facility, uh, walked half a mile on Saturday, and daily calorie intake average is about 3,000. Went from 89 pounds up to 110 pounds in two weeks. Uh, Fitbit, by the way, has no options for people who need to gain weight. Uh, so, yeah, definitely uh, wishing you well uh, with all of that for sure, DJ Devin. Uh, next up, I will send it over to Jeff. Hi again. So most of my work has been on the USB keyboard. This uh, weekend, I added support for alternate key maps. Right now, only ASCII is supported. Uh, so Naradoc implemented alternate key maps for USB HID, which were used for sending strings from a host or from CircuitPython to a host computer. But you can kind of create the reverse of that table so that you can interpret a an international keyboard's key presses into ASCII. So that is why that was useful. Uh, my testing was done on the French layout, which is known informally as Azerty. It moves around a couple of the alphabetical characters, including swapping A and Q, putting M where the semicolon is. Even more fun, you have to use the Alt-GR modifier to type curly braces and Shift to type the number. So it's really not a programmer-centric layout, but it's great if you need to type French letters, I guess. Um, Right now, modifiers, arrows, page up, page down, caps lock, etc., cannot be remapped. Those are uh, fixed in function. Uh, I got key repeat working, and the code is in a pull request to Scott's USB branch. If you want to take a look at that, there's a link in the notes doc. But I think actually what I will do is once Scott's initial USB host pull request is merged, I will recreate this pull request against CircuitPython instead of against Scott's fork. Uh, the other thing that I've been experimenting with is the screen-based text editor. It's in good shape. The most glaring omission is no undo, and the second most glaring is no search. Again, there's a link to that code in the notes doc. Uh, so what's up next? 
for this to be useful without a host computer, that means you're going to be displaying the editor on Display I.O. Display I.O. doesn't currently have a way to show you the cursor position, which did not used to be very important. But if you're using a full screen editor, it becomes pretty important. So we need some scheme to support a visible cursor. Um, you get Scott thinking about things, and he gets some very ambitious ideas. He's like, well, let's do, let's do emoji, and let's do CJK, and let's do everything. I'm trying not to bite that much off right now. I'm trying to just find a way to show a cursor on display I.O. Uh, no offense, Scott. Uh, the other things that we need in the core are to decide how the editor will be invoked, such as there's that moment at which you can press Control-C to drop into the REPL and any other key to restart your program. We might pick another letter like Control-E to start the editor. I think that's likely what we'll do. Um, and then the editor will need to be installable via CIRCUP, the repository transfer to Adafruit, and all that stuff. My one note on the experience of using the USB host, the keyboard stops working if I, for instance, leave CIRCUP Python running overnight. It works again once I replug the keyboard, uh, which in this case, I've only tested with one wireless keyboard. So the next step is to test with a different keyboard, um, and only after that trying to find if there's a bug and fix it. Um, and the other thing that I have coming up, uh, Lamar sent me a prototype of the Metro RP2040. It's currently inside the shipping system. Uh, my job is to check that the SD card works with both SPI and SDIO protocols. And I will probably initially do that just by building something under the Arduino uh, or Pico SDK setup. Ultimately, we'll need to pull in co some code from a library called Pico, Pico Extras into CircuitPython to support the SDIO using the PIO peripheral. And that will be plenty enough to keep me busy. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, next up is Katni. All right, so uh, since I can remember, which is to say I'm sure there's stuff I missed over the last two weeks, but I published the Gamepad QT guide, the STEM audio amp guide, the TRRS jack breakout guide, and the I2S BFF guide. Um, updated the SHT40 and 45 guide to include the new SHT41. This really good guide is in moderation. I took over the Python on Hardware Newsletter for three weeks, beginning last week, uh, shipped the first takeover newsletter this morning. Um, so this week, the first thing that's up is post-newsletter tasks. There's a bunch of stuff to be done and scheduled for the rest of the week um, once the newsletter goes out, uh, so I need to do that. Um, I need to go through the feedback. Um, on uh, guide reviews, uh, so folks review my guides, obviously, and then um, provide feedback and tell me stuff that could be done better. So I need to go through that. And then also I will be updating my Raspberry Pi breakout testing setup. Um, I don't use it that often and often forget, and then it ends up unusable because it's not even close to updated. Um, so I need to get that done and then actually uh, make it to do somewhere that reminds me to up Date it every so often, even if I'm not using it. Uh, most of this week, we'll be going through guide feedback. Um, whenever anybody clicks the feedback link, the bottom left of a learn guide, uh, it posts to um, like a background database in in Learn, and you can obviously not you personally, but I personally can view all the uh, feedback on all my guides. And um, Usually we go through that regularly, but it's been a bit bonkers lately. So um, I have a lot of guide feedback to do. And so that's going to be the task for this week, other than working with Paul on next week's newsletter. And that's what I've got. All right. Thank you, Katni. Uh, next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. So over the last couple of weeks, uh, I added the, some missing boards to circuitpython.org. I updated the LED backpack guide for the 1.2 inch 7 segment LED backpack. Uh, I updated the Matrix Portal S3 board definition to work with a newer revision. Uh, I updated the RGB display examples uh, to work with the latest pillow library. Um, I, w I wrote the EK79686 uh, 2.7 inch e ink driver for CircuitPython. And I updated the Adafruit CircuitPython EPD uh, library to work with the EK79686 
e-ink display. Uh, I updated the 2.7 inch e-ink uh, learn guide and I started working on testing out and figuring out a new touchscreen controller chip uh, to get working with the Raspberry Pi device tree. And this week I'm going to continue doing that. All right. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, next up is Paul. Thanks, Tim. Um, as we've been talking about, I'm working on the Python on Hardware newsletter. If you see some uh, news or a cool project, please make sure to let us know. Um, the more info we can get in there, the better. Thanks. For sure. Yep. Thanks uh, to you and Katni as well for taking that on. Uh, last up for the status updates is going to be Scott. There's the button. Uh, OK, so for me, uh, the USB ho host PR will be sent out early this week slash today. I got the PIO USB changes need needed uh, merged in, so I've got to update my stuff. Um, I was working on the IntelliKeys, but sending a report doesn't seem to be working, so I'm still debugging that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to PR even though it may not work perfectly, <laughs> and we'll go from there. Um, I did get hid report parsing and descriptor parsing working in Kaitai struct, which has an awesome web IDE. Um, I posted the code for that as gist so that you can just copy there and, and post them in the web IDE with your data. And then also I've been using Salia captures plus PySigGrok to analyze the USB traces. So um, I'm in, let's get the PR out and see how it works mode. And also let me keep working on it and, and find the issues. So. That's where I'm at. All right, thank you, Scott. So that was the end of our status updates section. Uh, the final section of the meeting is In the Weeds. As a reminder, In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These can either come out of status updates or be identified ahead of time. If you have an In the Weeds topic and you have not already put it in the document, please do that pretty much now-ish. Um, we do have one, so we'll start with that. And if another one pops up, then we'll hit that. Otherwise. We'll be wrapping up afterwards. Uh, the current item that is in there is from Tyeth, who's text only, so I'll read this one. It says, um, in the weeds related this uh, question, uh, got issues with the Adafruit SCD4X CircuitPython driver. Uh, seems to rarely have data ready equals true. Since filing the issue, I had a user in Discord with the same issue. Does anyone else have one of these CO2 sensors who could look into it? Um, I don't have the links, but it sounds like there probably is an issue link maybe that goes with that. Um, I do not, personally, I don't think I have that sensor. Otherwise, I would be happy to try it out, but... Ah, yes, there we go. Thank you for the uh, the link there. Beat me to it there, Jeff. Yeah, thanks. So it looks like, I'm guessing, uh, just based off the name, I'm guessing data ready is some API you can call it. It will tell you true false whether there's actually a value to read. And so then your code would be structured like check if there is a value and then if there is read it. And it sounds like oftentimes it tells you false. There is no value to read. I have two SCD41s and one SCD40. Uh, Keith the EE says, okay. Keith, if you, uh, yeah. if you end up having a chance. Yeah, I'll take a look into this um, probably tomorrow. Okay. Uh, with the SCD, it can only sample carbon dioxide once every five seconds. And it lets you pull it repeatedly. Uh, and if it's not ready to sample again, it just gives you the data not ready flag. Um, so I'll go into this. I've got a few. And uh, earlier this weekend, Dan and I were discussing with another individual uh, another inconsistency or issue with one of these. And I'm willing to bet they're probably tied together. These are, uh, when they sample carbon dioxide, they're very power hungry. And I have had to swap power supplies on two out of three of the sensors I've got. Uh, and it's, um, I'll look into it. Uh, and I'm going to try and get a, like, convenient little write-up of saying, hey, if you see these problems, consider looking into these solutions, because I've had it two out of three times, and then another user in the Discord had it this weekend. Um, but yeah, I'll take a look into it. Awesome. Yeah, uh, definitely appreciate that. And yeah, if, uh, once you, if you figure anything out like that, we can definitely add it to the README or uh, somewhere, maybe in an alert or something like that on the guide page or something to get folks pointed there. 
uh, if they are having similar problems, that's definitely good to know. Um, all right, so thank you to uh, Keith for that. Um, and we do not have any other in the weeds topics, so let me get back to here and we will wrap it up for the day. Let's do a timestamp for that one. Um, Okay, yeah, here we are. So uh, that was the CircuitPython weekly meeting for July the 10th, 2023. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated. If you, as a reminder, if you want to help support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be made available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontroller newsletter. Uh, this week's meeting will be in next week's newsletter since those are coming out on Mondays. The next meeting will be uh, on Monday, the 17th, seven days from today, uh, at its normal time of 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, the meeting, as always, is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. If you'd like to be notified of any changes to the day or time, uh, or you just want reminders, you can also ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. Uh, and that is all for now. So thanks, everybody, and we hope to see you all next week. Yeah.